Phillips, forgive me. Uh, she's the senior counsel of U.S. Soccer, and she's been tasked with with delivering a safe sport. A safe sport, as you may or may not have known, was uh, uh, was implemented a few years ago in response to the horrendous activity that was going on with the U.S. gymnasts uh, and, the, and the sexual molestation that was happening there. And uh, the response to that was, we, we need to do something. And so all of us, uh, everyone on this, if you're tied to the national governing body of U.S. soccer, and all of you are, uh, we have certain obligations and requirements now as a part of Safe Sport. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Allison. It was the displeasure from what we have to deal with because it's always dealing with somebody who misbehaves. Uh, but it's been a joy to work with Allison. And, and uh, Allison agreed to join us this, this morning to kind of let you know what is Safe Sport. What are our responsibilities when it comes to safe sport? Uh, and, you know, what Indiana soccer is doing to kind of help offload some of those responsibilities as much as we can uh, so that we can be in compliance with safe sport. So, Allison, welcome. And, and again, thank you for being here. The floor is all yours. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to address you today. Um, as Dave said, I'm senior counsel at U.S. Soccer. My primary responsibility is um, to oversee our athlete safety policy, but a huge part of my job is trying to support our members in keeping the sport safe and also um, creating and, and enforcing their own safe sport policies. So I really wanna be a resource to all of you when you encounter these issues. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Hopefully everybody can see my presentation. Um, I'm gonna leave it like this instead of doing the slideshow just so I can see you and monitor the chat for questions. But I'm gonna cover a lot of material in a pretty short time. I wanna make sure I leave plenty of opportunity for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me or you can put them in the chat and I'll make sure I save room at the end. Um, this is just, let's see, here we go. Uh, this is uh, our legal disclaimer. This is just informational. And so if you have a specific legal issue, make sure you consult with your club's attorney or with Indiana Soccer um, if you need advice with a specific issue. Uh, just a brief agenda. I wanted to briefly touch on U.S. Soccer's policy 212-3. That's the policy. That's our policy that kind of sets out what our organization members are required to have in the way of safe sport policy. And then the most important part of the presentation from my perspective is that I like to review reporting requirements. Um, like Dave mentioned, everybody on this call is likely a mandatory reporter now under federal law. And so I just wanna review the different types of allegations and incidents that you're required to report and where. Um, and then finally, like I said, I would be happy to answer any questions or take any feedback. So first, the 212-3 member requirements. I'll gloss over this pretty quickly because it's all, it's all in our policy, but this will just give you an idea of, um, of our the, the requirements that we impose on all of our members as far as prohibited conduct training policies, prevention policies, and reporting. Um, all of our organization members have to have a prohibited conduct policy um, that covers the types of misconduct that you see listed there. Um, they have to have a reporting process. So there has to be a way for people to report allegations of misconduct to the state association or to the organization member. All of our members have to have prevention policies. So you might be familiar with the MAP policy or the set of policies that prohibits one-on-one -on -one interaction between adults and minors. Those policies are designed to prevent, like Dave mentioned, um, the, the horrible things that happen in USA Gymnastics. The prevention policies are designed to minimize those um, those uh, scenarios where adults and minors would be one-on-one -on -one in isolated situations as a way of preventing abuse. So all of our members have to have policies that prevent one-on-one -on -one interactions. And they also have to have a way to resolve allegations of misconduct, a hearing or a disciplinary process. All of our members have to have a, a training policy and the center requires all, uh, all of the NGBs, including US Soccer and all of US Soccer's organization members to have uh, to require training of any adult that has regular contact with or authority over minor age athletes. And also new this year, 
The center requires all employees and board members of um, our organization members to be trained. Uh, we have to offer training to parents and to minor athletes. Um, and you have to be trained, if you're an adult, you have to be trained before you have regular contact with minors. Or, or if you have a, a new job or a new position that doesn't, uh, doesn't involve contact with minors, you have a 45 day grace period to get the training done after you start that job that requires it. For example, if you're employed uh, by a club or by a state association. Background screening actually isn't part of the center's requirements. It, it's a US Olympic and Paralympic Committee requirement, but because it, it it's sort of, we lump it in with safe sport and risk management. Our background screening policy at US Soccer is a minimum standard. I know Indiana Soccer Association and almost virtually all of our other organizations that have youth programming go way above and beyond this minimum standard that US Soccer imposes. Um, but we require in our policy that our members check against um, several publicly available uh, risk management lists and sec the, the sex offender registry in your state. Um, like I said, I know, I, I believe that all of our members that, that run youth programming actually do third party criminal background checks, but US, pol US soccer's policy just has a minimum standard requirement. So I went through that really quickly, but this is all in our policy manual, and it just gives you a good overview of kind of what a, the safe sport program at the member level looks like. So reporting requirements, this, um, you know, I've actually been speaking at a lot of our members um, annual meetings and town hall meetings, and this is um, the part of the safe sport program that I really like to stress because it's really, I think, the most effective way to stop abuse is to just make sure we're all aware of our reporting obligations and how and where and when to report allegations of misconduct. As I mentioned, any adult that's participating with U.S. soccer um, or its members, um, including employees, board members, anybody who's registered with one of our organization members or its members, its leagues or clubs, anybody that has a coaching license from US soccer or a referee license, we're all mandatory reporters under the Safe Sport Act. And so what that means is that under federal law, we're all required to report child abuse and sexual misconduct allegations as soon as possible, which the Center for Safe Sport um, has determined means within 24 hours. And so the reporting requirements are a little different depending upon the type of allegation. For child abuse, we're all required to report any allegation of child abuse, both to the Center for Safe Sport, but also to local law enforcement. Um, and for sexual misconduct, any allegation of sexual misconduct, obviously, if it involves a child, it would it would constitute child abuse and it would need to be reported to the Center for Safe Sport and to law enforcement. But even if you receive a report or you hear an allegation of sexual misconduct that involves just adults, that still needs to be reported um, to the Center for Safe Sport. And you can see the reporting information there below uh, the last bullet. And I, I've got it in here um, on a couple of other places too. So this is the, the definition of child abuse. It's the federal uh, legal definition is what we use. Um, so I won't read it, um, but you can see that, um, you know, there are some very obvious forms of child abuse that you would know if you heard about them. You can also have mental child abuse or mental injury. This one, I get a lot of questions about this. Um, it's very tricky because people are unsure um, what type of emotional misconduct or bullying rises to the level of child abuse. And so you can see there the definition of mental injury. That's um, mental injury, uh, mental child abuse. It's not just bullying or emotional misconduct. It's um, conduct that, that ends up basically causing harm to a child's psychological function. Um, and so it's a little bit of a judgment call. It's very, it's not very common, um, but we're talking, when we talk about mental or emotional child abuse, we're talking about more than the occasional raising your voice or screaming or bullying. It's um, pervasive, ongoing, and usually the way to tell uh, that it, it rises to that level is the impact that it has on the child. Um, if you hear that a child has to seek medical attention or has attempted suicide or has developed an eating disorder, those are all sort of signals that you might be dealing with a, a mental injury situation. 
Here's the definition of sexual misconduct. I mean, really anything sexually inappropriate, any type of inappropriate comment, any non-consensual touching or um, filming or exposing somebody to inappropriate or explicit material, all of that would be considered sexual misconduct. And it has to be reported to the center, even if you're talking about um, con uh, an incident that's happened between adults. This is a really important slide. I get a lot of questions along these lines too. It's really difficult um, for people to make a report when they don't have complete information. Um, but it's really important to remember that under the law, the reporting requirement is triggered by an allegation. And so what that means is that anytime you hear um, an allegation of sexual misconduct or child abuse, it triggers that reporting requirement. Even if you can't verify facts or even if you don't have complete information, the Safe Sport Code actually says that we're not allowed to do any type of preliminary investi investigation or verification of facts before we report. Remember, there's that 24 hour window for reporting. So really, um, when you hear something that fits into one of these categories, you need to make a report immediately, even if you don't have complete information. Um, you might not have the identity of some of the people involved. You might have heard something second or third hand. All of those um, scenarios, you know, you, it's, it's, you still are required to make a report. The other question I get a lot, and this is the third bullet, what if you get a report, let's say from a parent against a coach, and you know that there's a history there, or that, that they don't get along with each other, or perhaps she's upset about where her player's been placed or something like that. I always tell um, people that call about this that you never want to let perceived bias or motive, even if you have some questions about the reporter's motive, you never wanna let that keep you from actually making a report. Because remember, you can get in trouble if you don't make a report as required. But if you do think that there's some ulterior motive or something else going on, you can include that information in the report that you make. And I've done that when I have spoken to a parent where I feel like there might be something else going on or some history to the relationship that I don't understand. The other um, thing that trips people up, maybe they're not sure whether the accused person is actually part of, you know, maybe you're not sure whether the accused person is really part of your club or part of Indiana soccer or part of U.S. soccer. I always just err on the side of making a report and whether the center has jurisdiction over that person, that, that question is answered later. You don't want to let it um, slow down uh, or, or, or interfere with your, your obligation to report. And it's really interesting. I have had several situations where um, a report has been made about because a player has complained about a parent's conduct, like abuse by a parent. And you know, you never really know how that parent might be participating. You might think, well, he's just a parent in our club. He doesn't, he's not registered. But, you know, sometimes that parent might be have a referee license or a coaching license or be somehow involved in the Olympic movement um, and, and you're not aware of that. And so the, the bottom line is you want to report immediately when you hear any type of allegation that's covered in the mandatory reporter requirement. So again, here's the information about how to report to the center. Um, just a couple of tips on reporting to law enforcement. This is a really hard thing to do. It's very difficult because um, a lot of times local authorities don't understand why you're calling. Um, and so these are just here at the bottom, a few tips for making a law enforcement report. It's sometimes an uphill battle. You sometimes get shuffled around from, uh, you know, department to department or person to person. So my tips for making a report to law enforcement, if you hear about an allegation of child abuse that happens like, for example, on a field, let's say you hear that a, a coach has like pushed a kid uh, or hit a kid. Um, you know, I always try to choose the police department with jurisdiction over the area where the incident occurred because that's really oftentimes the uh, law enforcement's first question is, well, is this in my jurisdiction? Where did this happen? I always reiterate right from the start that I'm a mandatory reporter under the law. Police, local law enforcement isn't, a lot of them aren't used to hearing that in the sports context, but they do know what a mandatory reporter is um, in other contexts, like teachers or therapists or doctors. And so when you use that term, it gives them a heads up that, you know, you're somebody that has to make a report. 
And then lastly, just don't give up. If you can't get the, the police to take your report, try and document um, whatever information you, you can get however possible to protect yourself and to make it so that you can go back and show that you made a report as is required by the law. So sometimes I ask for the name of the officer to whom I'm speaking, or I ask for a badge number. And that way, if you know later on, you can show that you attempted to make a report, even if police, you know, doesn't want, if they don't want to open a file, or if they tell you they can't investigate, you have some record of having fulfilled your reporter obligation. So beyond sexual misconduct and child abuse, there are um, all types of other misconduct prohibited by the Safe Sport Code and our policies and Indiana Soccer's policies, and some of them are listed here. You definitely want to report that too. It doesn't need to be reported to law enforcement or to the center or to U.S. Soccer. You can report it to, you know, the person in your club that handles, you know, disciplinary actions. You can report it to Indiana Soccer. Um, but even these more minor violations or minor allegations, it's really important to get those reported so that they can be corrected. And again, our policy requires that our members like Indiana Soccer have a process for reporting these things and investigating them and resolving them. So these are just a couple of actual examples that we've been, I've encountered over the past, I would say over the past year. I change them frequently when I speak to our members based on what's trending, um, you know, different types of, you know, you'll, I'll see a trend in, in uh, a certain type of report that we're getting frequently. And so I use those scenarios as examples to hopefully help you understand, you know, what needs to be reported where. This first one actually happens a lot. So the, the twist here, a player, you know, a player's not playing well, isn't training well. The coach says, hey, what's what's going on? Is, are you all right? Is something the matter? And the player says something like, well, my dad hit me or my mom hit me. So this needs to be reported to local law enforcement or if they won't take your report, you can try like um, child and family services. Um, the, the reporting obligation exists even if you're not sure whether the, the participant's father, or I'm sorry, the player's father is a participant, because remember, we make that determination or the center makes that determination later. You always, always, always wanna make a report in that situation. Um, and it really can make a huge difference to make a report like to law enforcement about something like this. Um, it can make a big difference in the child's life. So even if you're thinking, well, the parent is just a parent, he's not really part of our organization, you still wanna make a report. The next one is something that I have seen a lot in the past couple of months, and I don't know if it's just sort of like post-pandemic kids sort of getting back together in social settings and not really acting appropriately or what, but I've gotten a lot of complaints recently um, about on-field, like players touching each other inappropriately or sexually on the field during the match. Um, you have to report this if you see it or if a parent or a player complains about it, it actually needs to be reported to local police. This is definitely a situation where you might not make a lot of headway with police. They might just say, well, we don't, we're not going to do anything about that, or we don't think there's any follow-up. But if you have a parent that says, um, I've seen it in the co-ed um, context a lot, and I don't know how many co-ed program, kids programs Indiana soccer has, but in some of the smaller states with the pandemic, there have been a lot of there have been a lot of co-ed programs, and I I've seen it quite a bit. And this follows this would be sexual misconduct, even though it's it's happening on the field. You want to report it, um, and even though um, both people involved are minors, the other twist is if the victim is a minor, it's child abuse. Even if the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator, is a minor too, it needs to be reported per the uh, mandatory reporting requirements. And I've had this question um, from referees a lot. You don't have to stop everything and do it right that second. Remember, you have 24 hours, but if you if you hear an allegation like that, it should be reported. So this is the one example that I've had over the last year or so of mental child abuse where I actually did make a report to local police and to the center. Um, and I just use this example to highlight sort of the difference between other misconduct allegations that you might be able to handle in your club or through Indiana soccer versus something that needs to be reported to the center. So I talked to this parent who called our hotline and sh this is what she claimed. I won't read the slide, but she basically said, look, my kid is totally depressed. I've had to get therapy for him. 
He's going to quit soccer. He stopped eating. He used to be an A student. Now he's a C student. His coach, like, and the, and the allegations were that this coach was like picking on him on a daily basis and like getting the other players to gang up, uh, gang up, 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 up on him. Um, his insults were personal. Like he was insulting this player about like how he looked and like t- telling him that he wasn't a boy and he was a girl instead and just terrible allegations. Right. And so I, because of the impact that this, these, this conduct had on this boy, I did end up deciding to report it um, because I felt like all of these physical symptoms and consequences that this player was experiencing kind of like raised the conduct to the level of child abuse. Um, And so this is just an example. And you can see the aggravating factors that I list there. Those are all things that I would consider. There's no magic formula, but if you see a lot of these aggravating factors, um, personal cruel insults versus just screaming to, about, you know, screaming to, at a player about how he's playing, um, you know, insults based on how a player looks, uh, that kind of thing, um, singling a player out all the time. Those are things that can kind of elevate emotional misconduct to the next level. I think this might be the last one. So this is an example that just highlights um, that sexual misconduct has to be reported to the center, even if everyone involved is an adult. This is a situation that I also had where a female referee accused a male referee of sexually assaulting her um, at an out of town tournament. You don't have to report this to law enforcement. You could certainly, you know, help the person, you know, the alleged victim do that if she wants to, but it does need to be reported to the center because it's sexual misconduct. And it doesn't matter that everybody involved is an adult. It still needs to be reported to uh, the center. This one is just an example of a lesser kind of allegation of misconduct that doesn't have any mandatory reporter obligations, but obviously you still wanna address it. Um, If you see inappropriate behavior by a fellow coach or somebody in your club, you definitely wanna address it because um, a lot of times, Um, I think this gets lost in the shuffle with what, you know, what's been going on in the news. I mean, sometimes a coach or somebody who's, who's acting inappropriately just needs a little guidance or a little coaching or some extra training, um, just needs an adjustment. So if you see, you know, like this example, you know, somebody screaming at a little kid standing too close, uh, you know, pointing his finger at a player or using profanity, um, definitely get, you know, report that to the appropriate person in your organization so that that behavior can be corrected before it escalates and and gets worse. You can always report anything to U.S. soccer. Um, Part of, it's a little confusing. There are a bunch of different places to report and depending upon the type of complaint, you can feel like you're being shuffled around. Um, But really the point is we wanna cast a really wide net so that we don't miss anything. And so we have an online reporting mechanism. We have a hotline. Um, anything that uh, that is that you need to report to the center, keep in mind that if you report it to US Soccer, it doesn't fulfill your mandatory reporter obligations, but you can always report anything to US Soccer and we can help shepherd the report and get it to the right place, either to the center or back to Indiana Soccer if it's you know something that's within Indiana Soccer's jurisdiction to resolve. And finally, my name and email and contact information is there. I, on a daily basis, take calls from people in our membership just wondering what to do or where to report. And I'm happy always to assist you if you're not sure, if you've you've received an allegation, you're not sure what to do, please email me or call me anytime. Um, And hopefully I didn't talk too long. Um, I really appreciate, again, the opportunity to share all this information with you. Um, It's definitely a team, a major team effort to keep our sport safe. And it requires everybody to sort of be um, on the watch and reporting misconduct so that we can get it corrected. Um, And so I really appreciate what all of you are doing on a daily basis to keep the sport safe. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me look and see if we have any in the chat. Well, while you're looking, uh, I again, this is Dave. I know there's an awful lot of uh, mandatory things that that, uh, Allison has shared with us in the last 25 minutes. And it seems like it's overwhelming that all these burdens are placed upon us as as clubs. Uh, And it it is, but keep in mind that 
what we're trying to do is, is it, build a, an imaginary fence or, uh, around our kids in order to protect them. Uh, I, I know years ago studying this, it said that one out of four females have been sexually abused by the time they become 18 years old. That's a stunning number. Uh, they said one in six boys, but my guess is the boys are equally as uh, are, are equally as offended as the girls. The boys just aren't as willing to say so when they get to be 18. Uh, so uh, it's a problem, and, and so we need to address the problem by being educated on what sexual abuse looks like, what grooming looks like, how kids are exposed either by bullying or so forth. Rather than than uh, say this, and this is what I learned when I talk with attorneys who are, are the prosecutors. They'll come in and talk to those who are around the victim. And they'll say, well, did you ever see this? Did you ever see that? And, th and then what they'll do, what they're waiting for you to say is, well, if now that you mention it, they're waiting for the, the folks around that should have been protecting this individual to say, well, well, now that you mentioned it, I did see that. Well, the horse is already out of the barn. The, 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 uh, the offense has already taken place. The child is going to be impacted for the rest of their life because we didn't know what it looked like. And so this whole education push is so that we know what it looks like, so that when you see it, you recognize it and we can do something about it. So I think if we look at it from that perspective that, that being educated is a good thing, that having all of our coaches, all of our administrators, and even parents educated on what these things look like, it allows us to recognize it. Uh, otherwise, we may not recognize that the activity is, is a part of grooming, or it might just be, you might think it's a little off color, but you really don't know what it is. Uh, so again, I, I embrace the idea of education. I'm not real fond of the legislation that's imposed upon us because our government and their wisdom, they make us criminally liable if we don't report. Uh, and I'm not real fond of that. I do want to protect our athletes. Uh, Allison, you've always been, uh, forgive me for butchering your last name. I've always known it's you. It's a hard last name. <laughs> well, I've always known you've, you've allowed me the privilege of calling you by your first name. And so I, I don't use your last name. And again, it's always a privilege to get to know you. I wouldn't have gotten to know you if we didn't have these criminals. I wish we didn't have the criminals. And I never knew you, but I'm so privileged to have known you. And I, I, I do appreciate what you do on a daily day, a day to day basis. And again, with just a, a couple of minutes left, are there are questions? Uh, Allison is going to be with us for few more minutes. So if you have a question, please ask. And I, I see a couple, Dave, that I can address in the chat. And just to um, follow up on your points, a couple of things. Just remember, um, you know, I have only seen a, the center, um, I guess, accuse people of failure to report when there is like ongoing sexual abuse that maybe let's say a club board of directors knows about and just doesn't do anything right like no i, I you know i've reported things late you know you just you, you can't know what you don't know so um you know it's it's important to remember that you can be criminally liable but really you know don't let that fear either deter you from reporting i mean i've reported things that i've read in the paper that you know, allegedly happened in the 80s, or I've, you know, that I think, you know, you come across something sort of in a strange way, just always make that report. The other thing that I will mention is that, and Dave knows this, um, it, you know, in my opinion, it's to a fault. The center provides um, extraordinary due process rights to anybody accused of misconduct like this. And so even if you don't know the whole story, or if you're not sure what happened, um, you should make a report. I promise you that the person accused will be, will have, you know, like I said, in my opinion, sometimes too much due process based on the circumstances. Um, but there's a process where that person will be able to clear up if it's a misunderstanding, you know, that person will be able to clear up a misunderstanding um, without any issue. Um, the couple of questions in the chat. Um, one question is a really good question. Would you not also report to DCS, CPS, in addition to police? Um, yeah, you absolutely can. So the statute says like law enforcement and any other organization as required by your state. So depending upon the law in Indiana, um, reporting it to Child and Family Services is a great idea, particularly if it's a family situation. If it's like an on-field thing that happens between a coach and a player or a referee and a player, 
sometimes these, you know, uh, family services won't won't really take your report because they're they they think they're limited to family situations. But certainly, I've also had times where I cannot make any headway with law enforcement, and so then I try uh, department of family, you know, children and family services. So that's a great suggestion, and absolutely yes, you should report to uh, DCS if that's um, a, a requirement in Indiana. The next question. As a club, are we required to have one person as a contact that all reporting needs to be kept on record? I don't think so. I mean, actually, Indiana Soccer can can impose requirements at, to the you know on the club level about what you have to do. It be it really is great to have somebody in your club or multiple people in your club that are you know the go to people for taking these kinds of reports. But our policy really is very flexible and then it lets our organization members, our state associations and other members, we just say that you have to have a program or a policy the way that you, and it has to have those components that I discussed, but the way that you um, set up your reporting process is really up to you. Um, and then the last question, um, Indiana, that, this is actually a question for Dave. Dave, the question is, you mentioned Indiana Soccer's reporting process. Where exactly can we find the details for that? Oh, and then I have one more. After you answer that, I I skipped one. So go ahead, and I'll come back to that question. Okay. So, and then the last question is: Are there template policies available? Yes. And so I should have put a slide on this. I was trying to keep it to my half hour, but um, www.safesoccer.com is um, a U.S. soccer website that's 100% devoted to athlete safety. And there's uh, our safe soccer framework is on that website. And it's a very long, like 70 some page document. The first part of it is US soccer's athlete safety program that we apply to our national teams programs. But the appendix, the appendix A in the safe soccer framework are model one-on-one -on -one policies that have been approved by the center. And so number one, you're totally welcome to just you know, steal our policy that we use for at the national team level and adapt it how you want for your own programs. Number two, when it comes to prevention policies, like one-on-one -on -one policy for meetings and electronic communications, there's a set of model policies at the back of the framework, and those are certified. It was a, like a six-month process of revision where we kept having to go around and around with the center before they actually approved our framework. That whole document's been approved by the center, and it's like certified compliant. With the, with the MAP policy. And so you can use those model policies if you want to create your own. Well, thank you, Allison. Uh, Indiana, to answer your question, uh, in the first quarter of this year, uh, Indiana Soccer, the staff, is, is or we've taken on an obligation to make sure that all the policies get reviewed. We have a third party that's an expert in this area that's reviewing all of Indiana Soccer's policies, and we'll be creating templates That'll be consistent with what Allison just mentioned. That'll be available to all of our clubs where you can just plug and play, so to speak, so to make sure your, your policies uh, are, are compliant with, with safe sport. Um, so we'll be we'll be kind of taking the lead on that. But as Allison mentioned, you can also go on. I don't know if it's, it's dot com or dot org. Actually, it the, the safety website is dot com. Okay. All right. Uh, well, again, uh, Allison, thank you so much. Uh, you've been gracious as always. Uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, a, a tough conversation, but one that we need to have. And uh, for, for those of you that don't and haven't contacted Allison and need to, she's always been very responsive uh, to anyone who calls. So Allison, again, thank you for the, the gift of your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you much. so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I hope the rest of your meeting goes well and everybody has a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.